when I was 17, I tried to go in as an aviation cadet. And I took the exam without asking my mother and father. And uh, I passed it, but I had to have their permission, which they would not give. The day I was 18, I went to the draft board. I said, look, I've already passed the aviation cadet exam, and uh, I want you to send me right away. Well, two weeks later, I'm on a troop train heading to Texas, and I thought I was going to go to Randolph Field and aviation cadets, but I ended up at the 90th Infantry Division. And when I got over there, I uh, went to my company commander. I said, there's been a mistake. I said, I'm supposed to be an aviation cadet. She says, no mistake, you're in the infantry now. <laughs> And so I went through basic training with the infantry and the 90th Infantry Division, about three months. And just as we were finishing it, orders came through transferring me to aviation cadets. So that's the way I got into aviation cadets. I wanted to be a fighter pilot, but I really never became a fighter pilot. I had a newspaper route, and uh, I recall when Hitler inv invaded Poland on September the 2nd, 1939, I had a paper route for the Atlanta uh, Georgian, which was a Hearst newspaper. It doesn't exist anymore, but it was about the same size as the Atlanta Journal Constitution. And my district manager called me about two o'clock in the morning and said, we've got an extra coming out. War is broken out in Europe. So I was down at the depot in East Point uh, by five o'clock, picked up my extras, and the headline says, Hitler opens war. And I went up and down the streets yelling, extra, extra, Hitler opens war. People came out. They didn't know if the United States was involved or what, but they were willing to pay a dime for the newspaper, and that's what we wanted. I was actually walking down the hall in our house in East Point when I heard on the radio that uh, Pearl Harbor had been bombed. And uh, mother and dad, of course, were very concerned about it, but the next day I went to school. I was a senior in uh, high school, uh, 17 years old. And uh, a group of us got together at lunch, and, and uh, we had recess times then. Uh, every one of us said, we're going to go in service right away. We were all very eager. There was about six or seven of us in this small group at that time, and everyone wanted to go in service immediately. Uh, about four went in while they were 17, the rest of us completed high school, and we had uh, six month, more months to go. But of those, uh, Billy Towns was killed on the invasion in Normandy. Tom Harper was killed at Aishima. Uh, Bobby Thompson was a paratrooper. He was killed. And uh, the rest of us lived through the war. Why did you join the armed forces? It was a very patriotic time. There was, it was a different environment we lived in at that time than we have today. There was not the political dissent that we had, and uh, there was much more patriotism. But also, when you're young, you want to get into something and some action. I wanted to be a fighter pilot, and uh, I, was, I was very active in aviation. My dad had been a pilot during World War II, World War I, let me get that correct. And my brother was an instructor pilot, and I was president of the Model Airplane Club in high school. And I uh, had read every book I could about flying. I knew how to do snap rolls and loops and emmermans and all the various ac uh, maneuvers, even though I'd never been in an airplane because I used my money to buy books on that. So uh, that, that was the reason. It was, it, I, wanted, I wanted to get involved. I wanted to get into action. Tell me about leaving home. Who were you leaving behind when you left? Well, m mother and dad at that time, <clears throat> because my, my brother, uh, immediately when war broke out, he was a junior at Georgia Tech in chemical engineering. Uh, he alre already had an instructor's license in flying, and he joined the aviation cadets. He went over to Montgomery to the classification center. They said, look, you're already an instructor. We don't want you to do this. So they sent him to South Carolina and he instructed uh, aviation cadets in, uh, uh, I think it was Bennettsville, South Carolina, during the war. What did war mean to you before you went over there? War, to me, had been, it was a certain, certain amount of romantic adventure involved in war because I had seen the movies of the 
fighter planes between the Germans and the French and the British and, of course, Americans. And my dad had been a uh, pilot during World War II, although he, World War I, I'll get that correct in a minute, but although he uh, didn't go overseas, he was supposed to go overseas, and the war ended before he got over there. So I, w I was very interested in him. Well, the hardest boot camp I had was in the infantry. That was in Camp Barkley, Texas. And um, we would have a what we call force marches, which was almost double time. Every afternoon, about a five-mile march just to toughen you up. And we had, of course, the obstacle courses and all the various things that uh, you'd do one-arm push-ups and climb ropes and various items. But uh, that was uh, uh, probably the toughest part, physically part. Then when I went into aviation cadets, they made me go through uh, basic training, again, not basic training, but uh, boot camp, you'd call it again, which was ridiculous. I said, look, I've just finished this. They said, yes, but you're in the Army Aviation Cadet Program now. You've got to go through the whole thing. So I thought it was a waste of time. When you finally broke boot camp, uh, where did they send you? Well, I went to uh, uh, Shepherd Field in Wichita Falls, Texas, and that's where I went through the uh, Army Air Corps, I'll call it boot camp, and uh, finish that program. From there, they sent us to uh, what we call a college training detachment. This was all part of the Aviation Cadet program. And this was at the East Central State Teachers College in Ada, Oklahoma. Which here again, I thought was a waste of time because I wanted to get into action. I wanted to get something done. And here they send me to this college training program. I got 10 hours in a Piper Cub, but they wouldn't let me solo. And I thought after three or four hours, I could fly the airplane. Now, I could have, but they wouldn't let us solo. Uh, but it was an enjoyable time because uh, I was young, and there were a lot of co-eds there. So we, we enjoyed that. Basically, it, we were just taking, uh, studying various subjects, not really military tactics, but they had things on math and English and so forth. And bear in mind, I'd had two quarters of college by that time. I had one quarter at North Georgia during the summer of uh, 42, and then one quarter at Emory during the fall of 42. And uh, so I felt as though that was a waste of time. I didn't, didn't want any of that. You know, I really never saw action, although I was in an action area, uh, from college training detachment. We went to uh, classification, and that was down in San Antonio, Texas. And there we took exams to determine whether you should be a pilot, a navigator, or a bombardier. I qualified as high as you could qualify for pilot, but also for navigator and also for bombardier. But they decided I was going to be a navigator. I protested. They said, we need navigators. We don't need pilots right now. So I went to training in Monroe, Louisiana, in navigation school. And then from there we went to Harlingen, Texas, for gunnery school. And... Um, then I was uh, selected to go into Air Sea Rescue and went to Keesler Field, where uh, in the meantime, I had graduated. I was a second lieutenant. But uh, I had been at the top or near the top of the class in celestial navigation because I, I enjoyed that. I was always reading books about the solar system and so forth. But they took four of us and put us in Air Sea Rescue. And uh, in navigating out in the Pacific, we had no radio aids. We had no, uh, there wasn't anything as GPS or anything like that. The only thing you had was the sun, and you had to navigate entirely by the sun during the daytime, the stars at night, because the only means we had to navigate and determine our position was by taking what we call sun shots. You measure the angle of the sun from the horizon up to where the sun is, and then there is a line that goes all the way around the Earth, and somewhere you're on that line for that particular angle that is on the sun. You don't know exactly where you are, but we did what we call dead reckoning navigation, and we take the speed of the airplane and the angle of the wind and the speed of the wind and the speed of our, uh, uh, our airplane and plot our courses where we thought we were. Then we would draw a perpendicular line from that spot to the sun line and call that our most probable position. That was our uh, position. 
after about uh, oh two or three hours of doing that, we would get it down to probably about a half mile because we used uh, artificial horizons. We were all, always searching at low altitudes, about 200 feet. You get any higher than that, you can't see a guy that may west his head or anything. And at that, ang that uh, level, you can get a natural horizon shot just like you can on a ship. A uh, May West is a uh, life preserver that all of the pilots had, and uh, they called it a May West because you would pull your carbon dioxide tubes and it would pop out and come out like that. So that's the reason they called it a May West. Tell me about the Air Sea Rescue. What, tell me about a couple of missions. Well, <laughs> Most of them were very frustrating because <clears throat> we would be given coordinates where an airplane was supposed to go down. And we'd fly to that coordinate and then we'd start what we call an expanding square search. We'd start out with one minute legs this in this direction, this direction, this direction, keep going square and then increasing them and keep as you keep getting a larger, larger area. And uh, most often we wouldn't find anybody. Uh, I'm certain that sometimes we may well have flown over somebody who didn't know it. But if they were in a life raft, uh, we had a much better chance of seeing them than if they just were, had a May West, a life preserver on, you just could basically see the head. Uh, but if you get up, oh, 1,500, 1,000 feet, it's just almost impossible to distinguish somebody that way. So what was it like flying that low? Uh, it wasn't bad. We had what we call radar, not radar, radio altimeters, and uh, we tried to set that on 200 feet and use that for the altitude. It was all hand flying, no autopilots. Our airplanes were quite slow, but they were good search airplanes. It was the PBY Catalina, which is an amphibious airplane, can land on water and land on land, and we cruised 102 knots. Uh, we were covering an outfit called the Jolly Rogers, which was a B-24 outfit. This was when we'd moved up to the Philippines. We were on Luzon. They were down on uh, uh, Mindora, which is just south of Luzon, south of Manila Bay. And uh, they were covering a raid on Hainan Island, which was all the way across the South China Sea. So we started out about four hours before they did because they were faster. And we had P-51s that would provide cover for us. We'd be about two miles off the coast while a raid was taking place. And if anybody were shot up in that raid and couldn't make it back, we'd try to get them to ditch. <clears throat> and primarily, we had submarines stationed uh, a couple of miles off. We'd try to get them to ditch near the submarine if we could. We coordinated our rescue intent with the submariners all the time. But uh, this one particular time you're talking about, a B-24 had been hit by flak. <clears throat> he wouldn't ditch. He thought he could make it back to uh, the Philippines, which was, gosh, seven or 800 miles. Uh, he got halfway across and went in. We were pretty far back at that time because even though he, had, uh, he was a damaged airplane, he was flying probably, oh, 85 or 90 knots faster than we were. We located the uh, oil slick and uh, saw debris. We landed in the water, but the swells at that time were probably oh higher than this room, maybe 20 feet high, but they were 100 yards or so apart. In other words, your water is like this. It was not really rough. There was not a lot of wind and wave action, but swells were coming. And when we were down in the valley of a swell, you really couldn't get that much view. So I got out of the airplane, climbed up on the wing of the airplane, and was trying to get a better view. My pilot, Sy Lacour, didn't know I was up there. I should have told him it was my fault. Uh, but anyway, after we searched for about a half an hour or so, he decides we aren't going to find anybody. We saw some life rafts that were uh, floating, no people in them or anything, and uh, other debris, but we couldn't find any, any bodies or any people. He decided to take off. I'm up on top of the wing. And fortunately, there were a couple of handholds up there. And I knew he was taking off because those engines were really roaring. I mean, it was just blowing. I thought, good Lord, am I going to be able to hold on all the way to the Philippines? About that time, all of a sudden, he cuts the engines. The nose of the airplane dips down. And I almost went over the front 
wing, but I had the handholds and I was like that. Uh, what had happened is Keys, our radio operator, was back in the blisters, and when he saw we were taking off, he ran up to the cockpit and told uh, Cy, he says, Lieutenant Thompson's up on the wing, Lieutenant Thompson's up on the wing. So he had cut the engines, but that was uh, probably the closest call I had. Blisters were two, uh, they were like greenhouses on the back of the airplane, one on either side. And they were observation points. We, when we conduct a search, we'd have usually our engineer in one and our radio operator in the other. They had binoculars and they would be looking on either side. And of course the pilot and co-pilot would be looking. And I would normally be uh, inside just looking at instruments and keeping my graphs and plotting out where we were going. My first duty station was BIAC, New Guinea. And we flew some uh, missions over toward Barneo and around New Guinea at that time. When Leyte was secured, we went to Leyte in the Philippines. And that's where MacArthur went on shore. Uh, we evacuated some wounded off of Samar, which was an island just north of there. We would land and uh, taxi up to the beach or they'd bring them out in boats and we'd take them to the hospitals, take them out to Manila. From there we uh, moved up to uh, San Marcelino in the Philippines, which is just north of Subic Bay, actually a little west of Subic Bay. Uh, Subic Bay is right in Manila Bay, near Bataan. You've heard Bataan Peninsula. And uh, we were uh, stationed there with the 345th Air Apaches, which was a B-25 outfit. We covered their raids on to China and what is now Indochina and, and down some of the islands to the south. Uh, they, then we moved for a short time to Florida Blanca, which was just south of Clark Field. Now you have to know the geography of the Philippines to appreciate this, but all of this is on Luzon. And then from there, we went up to Okinawa. Now we didn't get up to Okinawa until probably, oh, sometime in April, maybe early May of 45. There was still fighting going on in the southern part of the island, but we went to a place called Kadena, and uh, that was our station, and we were then covering, we'd been covering flights up around Formosa, which is Taiwan now. And uh, then we started covering flights up into Japan, rescue flights. Uh, from Kadena, they moved us over to Aishima. And that's where I was when the war ended. Aishima is a small island just off Okinawa. And uh, from Aishima, we covered primarily missions that were up around uh, Kyushu, uh, the southern part of Japan. In the Philippines, the Filipinos were very friendly. They seemed extremely happy that uh, we had come in and taken over from the Japanese. Uh, they would uh, come and, uh, well, one, this is an interesting story. A Japanese cruiser had been sunk off the west coast of Luzon, and apparently the paymaster had made it on shore with a lot of Japanese yen. Now, this is before the war is over. And the Filipinos had all this Japanese yen. They may have taken it out of banks, I don't know, because the Japanese, of course, controlled everything. But this is a story they told us, that they got it there. And they would come into our squadron area and wanted to sell us some Japanese yen. For two or three cigarettes, you could get several thousand Japanese yen. So I got a number of the thousand yen Japanese yen notes. I sent some home, and I had some on what we called our short snorter. A short snorter is uh, you would get bills from every place you had been, whether they were uh, English pounds or American uh, dollars or Japanese yen or Dutch uh, guilders and so forth, and we would scotch tape them together and you'd roll them up and uh, we'd put a, have people sign them and so forth. But anyway, I had some of those on that and uh, then when we go up to the uh, to Okinawa, at that time Okinawa had already been invaded and we had issued invasion currency. So we didn't think the Japanese currency would be worth anything. So none of us really were interested in getting stacks of Japanese yen. We just wanted a few of them. Well, after we got up there and the war is over, lo and behold, MacArthur says the Japanese yen will be the official currency. We'll not use invasion currency. We all thought, good Lord Almighty, here we had a chance to have all that money and we didn't get it. But that was just an aside there. We didn't have R&R. &R. It just didn't exist at that time. Um, it was uh, 
basically we were in our squadron area and uh, I've got a photograph of uh, our squadron area uh, at Florida Blanca there and uh, that that was where we basically stayed. Uh, there was not uh, really any fat fraternization with the Filipinos, to, so to speak, uh, there either. The interesting thing to me, though, was after the war was over, and we go in and occupy a Japanese naval air station in uh, Japan, we didn't see a woman for, uh, oh, I'd say 10 days or a week. I think they all thought we were going to kill them or rape them or what, but uh, they just were not around. But then after a week or two, uh, you began to see them, and they didn't seem to be afraid of us at that time. We had one crew that we lost, uh, we lost half of them due to Japanese uh, atrocities. And it was very hard on us because uh, Studs Meyer, the co-pilot, and I had been together for 18 months. But what had happened, uh, this crew, it was Chuck Allen's crew, and they were covering a raid up on Formosa, which is now called Taiwan. This B-24 had been shot up. And there's a little island just north of Luzon called Fuga, F-U-G-A. There were not supposed to be any Japanese on it. And uh, Chuck tried to get them to ditch, but B-24s had a bad habit of breaking up and ditching. It was very difficult to ditch them. And he thought he'd have a better chance to crash land on the island. So he crash landed in a clearing there, and uh, several of the crew got out, and uh, Chuck says, uh, or Charles, said they flew over it and saw them there. So they landed in the water, but there were coral cliffs and beaches, and he couldn't taxi up to the beach. So Studs Meyer and the radio operator got out and went in a rubber raft. They put a sea anchor out, and they went on shore. <clears throat> and lo and behold, there was a whole company of Japanese there. They captured them. They tied them to stakes in the field, which we saw. We flew over it. And they had them tied to the stakes. We tried to get the Army to go in, tried to get the Marines to go in. And they all said, look, the island has no strategic importance. We've already invaded Okinawa. And uh, if we go in, the first thing they do, they're going to kill them. And they also had the uh, uh, crew members of the B-24. These were tied to stakes in a field out in the open. And they were there night and day. They finally ended up bayoneting and killing them. But that was hard for us to take. And... Uh, so uh, we had no love for the Japanese. After we dropped the atomic bomb and the Japanese uh, agreed to surrender, MacArthur gave very implicit instructions to the Japanese as to how that would take place. He insisted that the uh, first documents be signed in Manila. And he told the Japanese that they had to have two twin-engine airplanes painted white with green crosses and they were to land on Aishima. That's where we were located. This is about the 15th of August, I would say, of 1945. I've got pictures of the airplanes landing. They're not good quality, but I have that and then some pictures of the Japanese uh, surrender party there. They then were taken and put on uh, C-54s, which were four-engine uh, Army transports, and flown down to Manila, where they signed the first documents agreeing to the surrender. Then the formal surrender that the world saw was on the battleship Missouri on September the 2nd in Tokyo Bay, with all of them there. But this was the first, first thing. So uh, we had that. Well, sometime between oh, August the 15th and September the 2nd, I don't know the exact date, but I would say it would probably be toward the very end of, of August, we were told that a B-25 had been on a uh, patrol up in the inland sea of Japan. The northern, the southern island is Kyushu, and then you have Honshu, and between that is the inland sea. They had developed engine trouble or something, but the war was over, basically. There was really no fighting going on. And they had landed at a Japanese naval air station called Onita, and uh, we were to go up there and pick up the crew and bring them back. But well, we landed in the water and then taxied up on a ramp, and uh, we were met by some Japanese naval personnel, and uh, they took us to the governor's palace where the B-25 crew was. Uh, we were very concerned about it at the time, but everything worked out, and uh, we picked them up and then took them on back. Then 
the uh, war was uh, over on September the 2nd, officially. The surrender was signed. And uh, we then occupied the uh, a Japanese naval air station called Kanoya, which is on the southern tip of Kyushu. It was a kamikaze base. We took the ceremonial hall where they gave the funerals to the kamikaze pilots, and we used that as our mess hall. And the uh, interesting thing is that... Uh, this base particularly had what they call baka bombs. In Japanese, that means fool. Uh, it was a basically a torpedo. It had plywood wings on it. It had three rockets in the tail. And the pilot was put in the airplane, in the bomb, and carried underneath a twin-engine airplane, dropped about 20 miles from the fleet, and then he had three rockets to propel him and to glide into a ship. Suicide. Uh, it astounded me that uh, they had that, but frankly, the Army Air Corps and the uh, naval aircraft had just decimated the Japanese uh, aircraft so much they didn't have enough airplanes to do that toward the end of the war. And we went back into the caves behind our air station. There must have been two or three hundred of these Baca bombs in the caves, but they had no means to deliver them. An interesting thing, when we first landed, there was a Japanese naval lieutenant that uh, met us, and uh, he spoke English. He also spoke French. He was well-educated, and uh, he said he was going to be a kamikaze pilot, but they couldn't get the aircraft in the air because they didn't have the twin-engine bombers. And I asked him, I said, well, why would you commit suicide? To Americans, that just didn't seem logical to commit suicide. He said, if I could take one American ship with me, it would be the greatest thing I ever did for my country. Never saw the guy again. In fact, uh, uh, two days after we were there, there weren't any Japanese around at all. They just, uh, Army personnel, Navy personnel, they just all disappeared, and we had to base to ourselves. You've got to realize <clears throat> that we're not the only people that are patriotic. The other side's patriotic, too. And now, of course, we have a horrible problem which is a religious problem with patriotism. And when you combine religion and uh, patriotism together, it, it's, uh, people do strange things. Uh, but I would say that almost every person I knew in service was extremely patriotic. There were really no dissenters that, that we knew. And, uh, you know, the homosexual thing you hear today, we never heard of, didn't know anybody homosexual. It was never never mentioned or a problem or anything else. I'm sure there must have been some homosexuals, but uh, I spent three years in active duty at that time, and uh, then during the Korean War, I spent another three years, never ran into it. But there was a different brand of patriotism. During the Korean War, it didn't exist like it did in World War II. I got out in March of 46, and probably the most important thing that ever happened to me in my life was I went to a small soda fountain just outside of my old high school, Russell High. It was a Sunday afternoon. It had to be St. Patrick's Day. And I went in. I saw the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life. We've been married 60 years. Uh, but that's Catherine. I thought she was older. She was a uh, senior in high school at that time. I'm three years older than she is. But uh, that's what I did. And uh, we married eight months later. I was attending Emory, and I went to Emory, uh, Emory University, uh, and I'd ride the trackless trolley out there. Uh, first, when I first went, we had streetcars uh, on the rail. Then I rode the trackless trolley. Then I had a, an A model Ford, and I'd drive that A model Ford out there, and Catherine was working downtown at Southern Bell, and I'd pick her up and come on home. And uh, so I graduated and got my degree. And I'd stayed in the reserves because I'd fly on the weekends at Dobbins. And uh, then in 1950, I was called back in and spent three more years in during the Korean War. Did you use the GI Bill? Oh, yes, I used the GI Bill. The GI Bill was great. It paid me $90 a month when I first started. Then went up to $105 a month and my tuition and everything else. And <clears throat> that really helped because I think Catherine... We had to live on my salary and uh, my salary. It was not a salary. It was a gift from the government, so to speak. But 
she was making about $125 a month, which was good money at that time. Did you get any medals? Not really. I have eight battle stars on my theater ribbons. I have the air medals, but I don't have any silver stars or distinguished flying crosses or anything like that. What do the battle stars signify? It signifies that you were in an area of the where battles were taking place. And there were, uh, I even have a battle star on my American theater ribbon. And the reason is, when we were at uh, Keesler Field putting our crew together, they had us doing submarine patrols out in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. People don't realize there were German subs there, but they were. And so our, our entire squadron got a battle star for that. But I have that, and I have it for uh, uh, New Guinea and uh, various battles that took place. Although I wanted to get into action, I wanted to be a fighter, fighter pilot, I was very frustrated by the delays that took place, and I didn't do it. Uh, I didn't realize how lucky I was until we picked up one crew that had gone down, and they were shot up and so forth, and then here I was, and we didn't have guns on our airplanes. We were painted white, but we always had uh, fighters covering us. But I didn't realize how lucky I was to be doing what I was doing rather than what I wanted to do and, do and go out and get shot at. Sherman probably put it best that war is hell, and... Uh, in wartime, World War II, we had what we call saturated bombing in Europe. We didn't pinpoint targets. We went and just saturated an entire city. And there were raids over Germany that would kill as many people in, I, I guess, Hamburg was one, as were killed in Hiroshima by the uh, atomic bomb. So millions were killed, but war is hell. There's no question about it. It's not glamorous, but to a kid, it appears to be glamorous because a kid thinks he's immortal and that he'll never die. How do you think that being in the war affected the rest of your life? Uh, well, I went in as a basically a child. I was 18, and I grew up in service. And I learned the discipline that you get in service. I learned the respect that you give others, and I learned that you have to take orders and follow instructions and so forth. And uh, I think that, that certainly affected my life. And also, you know, it's funny. Uh, we always say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. And uh, that was just standard procedure. In fact, in the, the uh, Army cadet program, they made you say, yes, sir. And you would do that, and you would salute your superiors and so forth. But today, uh, my grandkids don't even say, yes, sir. They say, yeah, no, and so forth and so on. But it's, it's a different world we're in. That was the most important thing that ever happened to me, oh. was that Sunday afternoon, St. <laughs> Patrick's Day, 1946. I'd been home one day, and I took my uniform off. I put my high school sweater on, and I went to the soda fountain across the street from Russell High, and I looked over there, and I saw these two girls. Oh. And this one was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen in my life. Sure. And uh, so I asked her for a date. And uh, she said, well, all right. I had a, uh, she was dressed up. She was dressed in a very slick looking, uh, very uh, black dress. She's just really very I'm sophisticated. <laughs> very sophisticated. But anyway, so uh, I had a Model A Ford and uh, I went to pick her up. I decided, well, I'd better put a suit and tie on. So I put a suit and tie on. She had a sweater and, and uh, Oh, Sadlock was on <laughs> at the time. We but we went to the varsity. That was our first date. And uh, yeah. oh, about eight months later, we married. We've been married over 60 years now.